Hello, I'm uh, David Minchin. I'm the chairman of Helix Exploration. Uh, you, you're joining us today on our first day of listing on the London Stock Exchange. I'm joined by the chief executive and the founder of uh, Helix Exploration, Mr. Bo Sears. And we're delighted to be able to have our interview with Crux Investors. How exciting. Day one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> A long time in the making, though, David. Uh, so when did this venture kick off, really? I um, myself and Bo we've been we've been friends for a number of years, uh, but really started working at looking at how to work together back in uh, August and September of last year. Uh, right. We raised a little bit of money on some pre IPO um, and had the idea of taking Helix into London. Um, London is a very sort of natural market for resource sector uh, projects, and particularly in in helium, there's a lot of demand for um, a lot of people in London know about helium. Um, that they know about the macroeconomics and the commodity profile, uh, but you know they, they 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 would like exposure to alternative uh, helium explorers, um, you know who aren't maybe look, looking in green fields and in risky jurisdictions. Juris, juris, juris so our, our focus with our uh, with our project in Montana, which has been substantially de-risked by historical drilling, which has has already identified gas on all, all of our target reservoirs. Uh, and in a jurisdiction where operating, uh, finding drill rigs <laughs> is really easy, um, and we're just rev- we're just we're ready and we're raring to, to to go. Brilliant. Well, look, um, we'll get into Bo. Hello, by the way. <laughs> Hello to you. Um, I'm just going to stick with um, David for a bit because I'm trying to understand the kind of the kind of corporate structure, uh, share register, and all of that. Right. So it, it's day one. You've gone and raised some money. A very good reaction from what I hear. How much did you end up taking? Well, we went out for between three and a half to five million. We ended up with a book of demand of uh, over twenty two million pounds. Uh, so we 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 we. we Taken down to seven and a half million pounds, uh, which is sufficient for us to do our scoping study, an appraisal well at, at Ingomar, um, and have the option to complete a, a second appraisal well before we, we move into feasibility. Right. Okay. And obviously, um, the, the kind of the, the, the corporate structure, share register is is really important for you. Was it so mainly retail, UK retail, or where was the money coming from? Um, high net worths of family offices. Um, institutions, uh, we're in a you know a good position because we were so well over subs- subscribed. Uh, there were some incredibly good good names and long term holders who were able to prioritize it in the allocation. Right. Okay. And and let's talk about the, the things that are really important to me. The the, the team and maybe Bo, you can jump in here. Um, because we 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 know from previous days. Um, you know where. Yeah, you know um, the, the experience, the experience that um, David has. But what about what about yourself? Um, what's your track record? So I've been in the space for I've been in the helium exploration space for the past twenty four years. Uh, began in the oil patch, developing oil and gas prospects. Made the made the transition into helium you know, twenty four years ago. Have, have drilled helium wells all over the country, mostly on the front range of the United States. Uh, understand the helium system. Understand where we should be looking. And and uh, going after large targets, right? Okay. And um, any success stories in there? Yeah, yeah. We I was the first uh, with my former company, Wow Group, Wow Helium, subsidiary of. We were the first uh, group to produce grade A helium in the country of Canada several years ago. Okay, okay. Um, and what about the asset itself? I mean, how, where'd you pick that up from? This was uh, picked it up through research. It, it's a very large anticline, uh, which differs from many other explorers today. Uh, a lot of explorers today go after one well fields or two well fields maximum, and that's really not enough to move the supply chain. So my focus was principally on large scale known structures in in a otherwise underexplored state like Montana. Right. Okay. And what do you, what did you know about what was the existing processing data or are you just going, it's in the right area? I mean, no, in the 1940s, a well was drilled and they tested inert gas that would not burn. And, uh, further research showed that, uh, it's in an area where high uranium and thorium exist. And that of course is the, the birth of the helium atom. Uh, as those heavier elements decay, helium is born. Uh, couple that with adequate faults and fissures that allow for the helium to escape out of the deep earth and, and, and good reservoir quality rocks. So all the pieces really lined up nicely for a good, large exploration target. Right. And and so what's the plan then? I mean, you get one well, start data, um, and, a, and a bunch of kind of um, variables which point to the, point the right way. What have you got to do to kind of prove this thing up? 
Uh, it's, it's it's more than one one well. There's actually quite a few historical wells on the site, um, which um, are both proving the structure in the subsurface uh, and also critically have identified gas in in all of our target reservoir horizons. So the well that Bo mentioned, the Hillson One one well, was drilled in the forties. That found. Uh, 195 foot of gas in the, in the Amston formation. That's the, the topmost of our stacked plays. Um, uh, obviously, they were looking for oil in, in the Amston. I mean, never assayed it for helium, but it was a high nitrogen gas. Um, a few years later, about 30 years afterwards, they identified that the, uh, that, that, that the uh, Charles formation was also an oil reservoir elsewhere in, in Montana. So they came back to Ingermark as Bo said it's a large closure, so if you're looking for oil, you go to the big closures, the same as if you're looking for helium. Um, and they drilled at the southern end of a closure outside of the Amst- outside of closure in the Amston, uh, but they drilled down in- into the Charles and they found 175 foot of gas in the Charles formation. Again, they tested it. It was high, high nitrogen, and again, it was never assayed for helium. Um, a really interesting well for us is one called Treasure 18 and 1, which is about six and a half miles off the crest of of the closure, so it's a long way down, down, down dip. Um, what what they found there was 145 foot of gas in the Charles form, formation. Uh, again, it was uh, nitrogen. Uh, again, it was non non flammable, and again, it wasn't acid for for, for helium. Um, interestingly, the wireline logs there uh, also identified 10 to 26 foot of gas in the flathead formation. Uh, which is the main re- reservoir horizon for helium across the entire Montana helium fairway. Um, and there's a number of uh, helium discoveries and indeed helium pr- pr- production that comes out of that flathead fair- fair- fairway. So for us to find gas um, in the flathead that far down dip gives us a great deal of confidence to where we come up and drill the crest of the, of the closure at a place called Clink, which is adjacent to the Hillison One Well. Um, it's a good it's a good indication that we'll find that that that, that gas again. Okay, and you're sitting on a sort of large land bank here, and you, you you've named it, you know Amazon, Charles, um, Flathead, etc. There's there's there's, there's there are multiple multiple targets um, that you can get after. You've raised seven and a half million uh, pounds, sterling, real money, um, to get after this. You've you must have obviously been conscious when you were sort of planning this, you know, from August last year. The equities markets are tough out there. Um, and you know, maybe some some green shoots uh, happening, but you've got to do things the right way. You've got to be efficient with that capital. Um, how do you think you play this? You know, lessons learned from Helium One. What are you, what are you going to do? I, I mean, a hundred percent being efficient with your c- capital is key to a successful company. Um, even more so in a market like 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 it is now. Um, you know. We've we've seen other companies who've had to run massively dil- dilutionary raises because they've run out of cap, cap capital. That's not not a situation that we're going to find ourselves ourselves in. Um, well, one of the benefits of operating in Montana is it's a much cheaper jurisdiction to to drill than other parts of the world. So um, there's a a lot. You know, it's, it's historically it's an oil and gas state. All of the service providers are there. There's rigs there. Um, and we've received quotes uh, for about two and a half million dollars to drill and test an appraisal well, but uh, vert- vertically down to eight thousand feet, which can test all, all of our stacked reservoirs in in, in one well. Um, so you know, other than that, it's making sure that we keep a grip on GNA and making sure that we uh, that we communicate clearly with the, with the market everything that we're doing uh, to make sure that the company runs six. Runs as a success. Well, I guess what I'm trying to, trying to get at is like the number of companies that kind of come on here and say, "We're just going to drill, drill, drill," which is what they've always said, and it's the and it doesn't get them anywhere. It doesn't get a reaction from the market. Um, doesn't get them um, the type of data that kind of excites groups who may want to fund them um, if if they're looking for some kind of alternative funding. You've got to look at the market differently these days. So for you, you can ask the question of you know any lessons learned or any observations, or do you feel that because helium is in, in a desperate shortage, um, that you don't have to concern yourself with looking at the uh, at how you progress and grow this company any differently than you would have before. No, I mean we, you're absolutely right. Uh, being a bottomless pit of dilution is a death knell for for any company. 
Um, and we're we're lucky with um, with with Helix and with Helium that that's not the case. You know, we we have a very very aggressive timeline planned. Uh, we're going to be drilling in Q3 of this year. Uh, that's going to be about two and a half million to drill the appraisal well, uh, with an option to place a second appraisal well if needs be, thanks to the over subscription which we had on on the, on the raise. Um, moving into construction, um, you'll get all of the data out of that one well, and then 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 necessary for you to go into detailed engineering and to and to to build a pressure swing adsorption plant. Uh, which will allow you to, to monetize the, the the field and the, and the gas site that you have. Um, we're looking at about twelve and a half to fifteen million dollars to build a pressure swing adsorption plant uh, to produce uh, compressed helium gas um, within about fifty five thousand MCF a year uh, at a one and a half percent feed grade. So, what that means is. If you're selling that at mine gate with, um, uh, let's say, for $550 per MCF with a $50 per MCF OPEX cost, uh, you're, you're looking at a cash flow of uh, $25 million before royalties and uh, taxes from a single module plant. Um, and, and the payback on that is then very, very fast. Um, because of that rapid pay, payback and the high margin uh, post-appraisal, uh, it was several ways, routes available to option to, to, to finance that plant. So, you know, we, we could be looking at debt. Uh, uh, we could be looking at leasing. Uh, we could be look, look, looking at pre-selling our helium, um, you know, because we, 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 we know the buyers who are going to want to pay now for helium in 12 months, months time. Uh, so... If the equity if the equity market isn't uh, isn't open for for us, and the best way to uh, to to maintain NPV per share is to look at non dilutionary funding, uh, there's lots of options available to, to us, um, which should all steer us into production uh, before the end of 2025. Okay, so few things one um you know lots of companies talk to me about the theory of doing stuff and and, and i want to try and understand the how do you get to the point where you prove the economic reality of this because some things don't change no matter what the commodity is so you're going to need to show scale um for you know to be able to um, understand the economics around this one so in terms of um you know continuing to kind of test the field how do you kind of move through the phases and and be able to point to well here's how we would manage this field you know um, how we would fund this how what time frame involved and what, what does that look like when it comes to helium which not many people know much about sure it's all going to start with the first well right it is helium it's expiration after all and you really have to to you're going to get a wealth of information off the first well and you'll you'll be able to to test any zone of, of that we have of interest for in this case. And you you do long term flow tests with uh you gather all the pressure data you could possibly imagine and so that you have a pretty concrete uh image of what's capable of production. And from that information you can start a development program to uh to pick other wells, other locations in which to drill a well. And then from that information, you can design a plant. So these these helium plants are very bespoke devices. Uh, they are designed for the composition of the gas. They're designed for the flow rates. And there's various modifications you can layer onto them depending on the composition of the gas. For instance, you could use a, a membrane unit on the front end of a pressure swing adsorption plant, which allows you to increase the throughput and enhance the helium concentration. So lots of options available. But it all starts with the drill bit. Is it similar to, to conventional gas in, in the sense that the decline rates are the same? Or I mean, how, how does it work with helium? It's exactly the same. So think of it this way: you're using oil and gas equipment. So it's it's akin to mining and oil and gas. You're using oil and gas equipment, but like mining, you're going after a small component of the overall gas stream. Hence the processing equipment. Yeah, um, Bo, just in terms of um, you know ma the management of the fields, you know, you talk about these obviously these test wells comes with the first well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the way that the gas flows, the helium flows, it is similar to gas in the sense that you kind of got to ma manage it. Probably, what does that look like? How do you kind of plan that out at the point where you look to commercialize 
the field. Once you flow test, you will have a fairly good handle on the producible rates of gas, the prudent flow rates of the gas. What you don't want to do is produce the gas so quickly that it damages the reservoir or starts toning water. So it is eerily similar to natural gas. Uh, you need to produce these things gingerly and make sure that there is no 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 overproduction whatsoever so that you these things can last quite a long time. Right. And, and, and to come back to my question around scale, I mean, what do you need to see from the drilling to be able to feel comfortable that this is going to give you what you want? Commercial flow rates. And that can vary, right? Especially depending on the amount of helium in the gas. Uh, you know, pressure swing absorption plants, those are small scale uh, gas plants that uses pressure as the facilitator to process the gas out. Uh, fairly low cost, low pressure uh, units that allow you to monetize the gas as the field is being developed. And they're modular to units, so you can add another unit on if you increase the throughput. Uh, the end goal here is to have enough helium where you can install a liquefaction unit because if you can install a liquefier, then your global market opens up. All the helium that is uh, moved around the globe today is moved in liquid form, in liquid helium ISO containers, which contain 11,000 gallons of liquid helium or about a million cubic feet of gas equivalent. And so that's that's the primary goal here uh, from a, a global Supply effort. Okay, and, and talk to me about the the market at the moment because you know everyone says, oh, we, we, you know, helium is in short supply, prices are high. What's the sustainability of, of this current pricing environment? Like, you know, who are the suppliers of helium into the market? Where's the competition coming from, and how do you insert yourself into it? Well, at the moment, helium is in critical short short supply, as you said, and you just have to look at how the pricing is behaving to really understand just how critical that 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 that, that, that is. It's been a number of supply side crises over the last 20 years, which has resulted in a price increase of uh, averaging 20% AGR over the last decade. Um, we're seeing import pricing into China of between five and six hundred dollars per MCF. Uh, we're seeing individual end users out of the United States uh, paying a lot more more than that. So, for instance, we saw NASA signing five-year deal in November 2022 for a five-year supply of 1.2 billion cubic feet and $920 per MCF. Uh, we've seen the data published by the uh, United States uh, Defense Log Logistics Agency. So that's the buying arm of the U.S. Army, and they're paying $1,080 per MCF. Obviously, that's for all different s s s sizes of containers. Uh, but it, it speaks to people paying a premium to get security of of, of supply, um, and we're not seeing that situation disappearing any uh, any time soon. I mean, the majority of helium supply comes as a byproduct of natural gas production. So you've got the, the large field in, in Wyoming and the North Field in in Qatar, uh, b between them providing over fifty percent of the world's heli helium. The North Field in Qatar is providing it from a gas which is a 0.013% helium. So it's obviously not being driven by the economics of helium. It's just that when, once you run that volume of gas through the liquefier, uh, the exhaust fumes make it economically worth worthwhile to extract that, that helium. But it's not economically feasible to expand the plant based on that heli helium. Uh, indeed, when I was uh, looking to raise money for Helium 1 back in 2020, uh, that there was a Northfield expansion which was due to come on stream in 2023. Uh, here I am raising money for Helix in 2024, and that Northfield expansion is due to come on stream in 2027. So, you know, four years on and it's still three years away. Um, and that's often the story with these big me mega projects. Um, what's needed is a new supply of primary helium where the primary economic driver is the helium gas in that, uh, where you've got um, simple bimodal gases made of nitrogen and helium, and your and your capital cost into development is significantly lower, uh, which can allow new new suppliers to become the swing suppliers to meet expanding demand, um, particularly in the United States, uh, where the Chips Act is like, like likely to dramatically increase demand over the next few years. Right. Okay. And if we if we look at a lot of the other kind of commodities um, at the moment on the critical minerals lists across the, across the world, but specifically the, the U.S. in terms of 
um, Department of um, Defense, Department of Energy Budgets, and, and, and various other um, U.S. government bodies. They are tr- these companies are trying to kind of um, get grants, they're trying to get tax incentives, trying to get themselves met, um, stuck stuck in the middle of um, various like IR- IRAs, for instance. You know, what's the what's the goal for you guys? Day one, but let's talk about the government. Day one, um, how? How do you make yourself kind of critical or important in the U.S. market, given it's uh, what a two, was it two two BCF um, annual demand there? So it's, it's pretty substantial, and not a lot of domestic production. Any large scale helium uh, production is going to help with the supply issue. So right now, the, the entire helium global supply chain is controlled by a group, an oligopoly of major industrial gas companies. Not a single one of them is exploring for helium. They should, but it's not their, it's not their uh, their modus operandi. They are principally bulk gas movers, and bulk gas being nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and other chemicals and gases. So any helium found is going to help, especially in the United States, uh, fill those supply gaps that continue to arise, because because the global helium market comes from the same sources. Any supply shock. Plan is going down for scheduled maintenance or unscheduled maintenance or, or otherwise, there are severe shocks. And when those severe shocks happen, groups like Intel, uh, their, their plants have to shut down or, or reduce capacity. Uh, there's a lot of industry that is completely reliant on helium. You know, without helium, we are truly living in the Stone Age. We are, in fact, in fact just for people are perhaps not as au fait with it, um, let's talk about some of the sectors that are um, affected if we don't, if we run out of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the MRI uh, industry is quite large. Those devices obviously use liquid helium to achieve superconductivity. There is no substitute for MRIs. They re- rely on helium, and they are capped at supply of helium. They could, it's an industry that could grow with more helium. Uh, semiconductor manufacturing is the next big one. Uh, that's going to be even larger, especially as semiconductor chip manufacturing moves away from China and elsewhere. Uh, those things require massive amounts of helium. Uh, fiber optics is another one. All of these industries are completely re- reliant on helium. They must have it. If they don't, their plants shut down. It is, uh, it, it's, it's, helium is a just-in-time inventory product. So once you produce it, you got to use it. There's no storage. Uh, it's, it's just so critical in, in any of these uh, manufacturing processes. Right. Okay. Well, look, gentlemen, look, that's a nice kind of introduction to um, what you're doing, where you're doing it, how you're doing it, fund- funded for the next phase. Um, stay in touch. Let us know how you get on. It's getting pretty exciting in the helium space at the moment. So uh, appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you much. Cheers.